So thank you very much for coming today. Do I need to use the mic? Or am I audible? Okay, let's see. Thank you very much for coming today afternoon. And I'll speak on the topic of seeking security in insecurity. Learning to flourish amidst change. For all of us, when we go through life, we want some kind of steadiness, some kind of stable, stable platform on which we can function. And yeah. our whole life, yeah, our whole life is actually right from our day-to-day -day efforts to our technological efforts. That all basically we're looking for security. We may have for our physical data we have bolts with lockers. For our digital data we may have backups. It's the same principle. We're looking for security in our relationships. We may seek assurances from others. We may want to have some insurances by which we want to make sure that we don't lose things. And in this way, various things that we do essentially are for seeking security. And where there's threat of life, we may wear armors, or we may, as a nation or a state, come together to have armies. Through all these, we're looking for security. And for me, one of the first incidents when I was about seven or eight years old, I had gone to a zoo. And there, in that zoo, there was a cheetah which suddenly broke free. And when it broke free, it was pandemonium everywhere. But after some time, when the people came to catch the cheetah and put it back, what struck them was Actually, the cheetah was as fearful as everyone else. People were afraid of the cheetah, but all the people, the animal itself was afraid of everyone else. And all, when he got his trainer, whom he knew over there, all these people were coming and looking at him, poking him a little bit, poking that creature. He was fearful. So sometimes when something appears to be threatening also, Yes, it may be that it's a fear for us, but every aggression that somebody is doing, most aggression also arises from insecurity. When somebody is aggressive, they create insecurity within us. But often their aggressiveness comes from their own insecurity. So insecurity can be financial, it can be relational, it can be emotional, it can be physical. It can be national. So various activities that we do are all motivated by this urge for security. Currently, immigration is a big issue nationally in America as well as in, as in Europe some time ago there also. Even in India, we have neighboring countries from which immigrants are coming. And this also is a security issue. So if we look at our lives, most of the things that we do are motivated at some level by the desire to seek security. Now, in this search for security, often there is what has been called the security theater. It's like when there's a theater, in the theater, there is a theatrical performance that is done. And what is done in the performance doesn't actually happen in reality. So security theater means those activities that are done which make us feel that we are becoming more secure. But whether they actually contribute to security or not, that is open to question. After the 9-11 terror attacks happened, there was for some time almost a paranoia about flying. And people thought that maybe if I drive my own car, if we are just passengers in a plane where we have very little control over the fate of the plane. On the other hand, if we are driving our own car, 
it appears as if we have greater control. Now, statistically speaking, the now percentage of casualties because of car accidents is much more than that because of plane accidents. And that also taking into consideration how many people travel, but still even percentage wise, plane travel is safer than car travel. But still, when we feel that I am in control, we think we will have greater safety. Not only that, if say somebody is sitting at home watching TV, maybe they are watching movies or watching news of how crimes, crime is increasing here, crime is increasing there and sometimes you are walking on the streets and some thug might come and rob us of something, attack us and we think, oh, better I will not go out. And people may be thinking that, okay, being in my home comfortably watching TV is safer. Somebody say, or goes out on the streets, maybe to walk, to jog, to exercise. There's greater danger that somebody might attack. Yes, there is a danger of intruders attacking. But statistically speaking, again, sitting at home and watching TV for long hours may set one up for a heart attack. And the percentage of people succumbing to heart attacks is much more than the number of people who succumb to attack by intruders while they are on the streets. So the point I am making from this is that there are certain activities which create the illusion of security. And often the illusion of security is the greatest enemy of security. <clears throat> One of my friends is in the Air Force. He was telling me that Actually, because now we have a lot of security check-in before we go to the airport, one disadvantage of that is people will become complacent. Oh, there's so much security check-up, there's nothing to be so worried about. But the fact is there is no, no protector greater than alertness. If anything suspicious there, so the security theater means the activity that we may do in our life, which we may do individually or we may do socially or nationally, which create an illusion of security but which do not actually increase the security in reality. Now moving forward, if you consider, yeah, actually as far as security is concerned, it is almost at one level an impossibility. We live in a world of constant change. If we compare consider our breathing. If we try to hold our breath, we lose our breath. The way to protect our breath, thank you. The way to protect our breath is to keep it flowing. The moment we think, okay, this breath, if somebody thinks there's so much pollution out there, if I breathe in, I might get polluted. Okay, that's possible. But if you don't breathe in, you're going to die. So, just as the secure state in our breathing state is not holding the breath. It is letting the breath flow in and out. A society whose goal is security. It becomes like a society where everybody is having a breath retention contest. The person who tries to retain their breath the most, that person may end up dying first. So security is definitely important. Just as our breath is important for our life. But the way to seek secure, say, way to protect our breath is not by holding our breath. It is by letting it flow. Similarly, the way to seek security is not necessarily by is creating external structures that will provide a security. Because in some ways we could say that a person who stays in house arrest would be the safest. But is that security worth having? Person is, uh, protect, is protected by guards, is at home, you know, it's reasonably comfortable. We want security, but we want something more than security in our life. We want a purpose in our life. We want something positive to live for 
and in the pursuit of that something positive, we want security. So let's consider financial security. If we consider money, it's important in our lives. Making money is important, but what we make with money is even more important. After we get money, what do we do with it? Money is not what we live for. It is what we live with. It's a resource and it's a vital resource. But when, when money becomes the purpose of life, then that distorts the priority of our life. A person whose only purpose is to earn more and more money, that person will actually be more insecure than a person who does not have that much money but who has a meaningful purpose for their life. So security is important, but security is itself not the ultimate end. We want security for some purposeful end in our life. Now to understand what this purposeful end is, we need to look at a broader picture of our own life and our own self. If you look at our life and our longing for security. A, our security, ultimately the security that we want is the security of life. There's financial security, relational security. Ultimately it's we want to live. Now if we look at the world around us, nothing stays forever. And yet every one of us has a deep desire to live forever and to love forever. Most of the movies and novels are about romance. And most romance is about happily ever after. I mean, real life, no relationship lasts forever. And yet, we all desire to live and live forever. Where does this desire come from? If we, you say there was a remote African tribe where people are completely disconnected from the rest of the world, no internet, no cell phones, and one day a child comes and tells his mother, Mom, I want a pizza. What is the first question the mother will ask? Where did you hear about a pizza? There's nothing in the environment which will give the child the idea of a pizza. So then if there's nothing externally that will give rise to the desire for a pizza, where does the desire come from? So similarly for us, if we look at the world around us, everything around us is changing. Nothing lasts forever. When this kind of change is there, why would we at all desire? to have something unchanging. Why do we even want security? Even the giant mountains, they don't last forever. So our desire for security, our desire for continuity, our desire for something unchanging to hold on to, that comes from our core. It doesn't come from our externals, it comes from our internals. And that core is our spiritual essence. Our spiritual essence is indestructible. And it's that indestructible essence that is the source of our present longing for security. So the Bhagavad Gita is an ancient yoga text that offers us uh, understanding of the self which involves three levels. So we have this Three level model of the self is the body, mind and soul. The body is like the hardware, the mind like the software and the soul like the user. Now we as the, we as consciousness, as the source of the consciousness, the soul, we at our core are indestructible. This is what the Bhagavad Gita tells us. This is what the yoga texts, they ultimately point to. Now this, it's a model of the self. 
let's try to see if we could get some further understanding of this model. Let's do a simple thought experiment to illustrate this. Okay. So, I had come here about four or five months ago. How many of you were there at that time? Okay, one of you, fine. Thank you. I had done some th thought experiment at that time, so I was wondering whether I should repeat that or do the other one. That's why I was asking. So, now where you are seated, you can be comfortable and then you can close your eyes. As you close your eyes, now you can take three deep breaths. your body and see which part of your body is the most tense. Your fist might be cl clenched, your feet might be tensed, maybe your forehead, your brows are clamped down. Whatever part of your body that you notice is tense, now try to focus your attention on that. Suppose you notice tension in your hands. Try to focus your attention on your hands and open your hands and release all the tension that is there. As you are focusing your attention on the hands, try to visualize your hands in front of you, in your mind's eye. You can clench your fist once again. Clench it as tightly as possible. Visualize it on that inner screen. And then, let go. Release it. And as you release it, you can see that fist on your inner screen. As it opens up, the full palm is opened. And as you unclench the fist, you feel the tension going out of your arm. You feel the tension going out of your body. You feel yourself relaxing. Now, as you're observing on that inner screen, your hand, the image of your hand may stay there or it may flicker and something else may appear. Suppose some other part of your body appears. See, you think of your feet. If you feel that they are tense, whatever tension is there, just repeat this exercise. Tighten it and then release it. As you release it, you feel the tension going from your feet, from your foot, as well as from the rest of your body. Conceptually, you could repeat this exercise for every part of your body. You could do it for your belly, your heart, your lungs, even your brain. You could visualize it appearing in front of you in your mind's eye, clenching it and release, tightening it, releasing it. And you'll feel yourself relaxing. And through it all, you remain the observer. You observe various parts of the body appearing on your mind's eye, on your inner screen. But you remain different from it all. You remain the observer of it. You remain the experiencer of it. 
So you're the inner screen on which various parts of your body appear. That inner screen is your mind. And the seer of that inner screen, the observer who notices tension and who senses relaxation, that observer is you. That is the soul, the consciousness. You can take one deep breath and you can open your eyes. Thank you. This thought exercise, which also involves a little physical exercise, it actually can make us aware of our body and aware of ourselves as different from our body. It makes us aware of which parts of our body are tense. So we become aware of our body. But as we become aware of our body, we also understand that I am the I am the awareness of the awareness. I am someone who is aware of the fact that I am aware. So that awareness is different from the body. And within this exercise, when we did this further visualization of trying to visualize that part of the body on our inner, on that inner screen, that is the mind's eye. So basically, when normal perception happens, it's a three-phase experience. It's there is the outer, there is the outer sea. Say for example, you are looking at me, I am looking at you. That is the outer scene. Then there is the inner screen on which the image from the outer scene appears. And then there is the inner seer who is observing that. Right now when you are hearing me, if suddenly you remember, why did I, where did I put my car keys? Are they with me? Have I lost them? Have I lost them? Will someone steal my car? Oh, what will happen if my car gets stolen? One thought comes up and immediately, for a few moments, you may not be aware of what was spoken or what was happening. Why does that happen? Because on the inner screen, something else is coming. So our insecurity, how it arises and how we can deal with it, we'll try to understand using this model, this three-level model of the self, which involves the outer scene the inner screen and the inner seer. So I'll talk about the fear acronym. So uh, this is four points for dealing with fear. Focus, engage, arise and release. Let's begin with the first one, focus. Focus means when fear starts coming up within us, we need to focus our attention, but the inner screen on which we are meant to see the outer world, it is meant to be like a window to the outer world, but it becomes like a movie, like a TV screen. About six months ago, I had come here to California and I had been to a friend's place and he had a house which in the back side there was a view of the forest and we were sitting big window we were chatting while looking at the window and suddenly I noticed from the window a huge gorilla moving rapidly towards the window it was giant like something we might see in planet of the apes and this charged on about to smash the window I was alarmed and I looked at him and he was smiling, grinning. What happened? What's happening? And then I looked at him, he had something in his hands. So then I looked, he had some kind of device which looked like a remote. And then, as I observed, he pressed something and the gorilla disappeared. I said, what is this? And he told me that he had designed that window in such a way that the window could double as a TV screen. So he presses a button and the window changes into a TV screen. 
and when that happens just for fun he had arranged for an animated display of a gorilla appearing with the same background as is seen through the window so at one moment you see the beautiful scenery and next moment suddenly a gorilla appears so if somebody doesn't know what is happening they will not know when the window is functioning as a window and when it has started functioning as a tv and once it starts functioning as a tv all kinds of apparitions can appear over there similarly for us when we feel insecure when we feel fear essentially what happens when we feel fear is the inner screen becomes like a tv screen and it starts displaying a horror movie and it is that horror movie that is being displayed that causes fear say we come to office and our, we see a strange look in our boss eyes just see that look and then we start thinking why is my boss looking like this am i going to be fired oh if i'm fired then how will i pay the mortgage for my house oh if i can't pay the mortgage then i'll be evicted where will i stay oh, i'll have to stay on the streets but it's so cold how will i stay in the cold now right now we may be feeling cold because of the ac but when the movie starts inside us we may start feeling cold because of thinking that we will be out in the cold so for us most of the time when fear occurs it is because some stimulus from the outside triggers a movie inside us and that movie is a horror movie and that is what causes fear in that horror movie this may go wrong that may go wrong that may go wrong that may go wrong and depending on how strongly emotionally invested we are in something the more vivid and multicolor and graphic the movie comes out to be and that's how we get overcome by fear so the first step for dealing with fear is focus focus means we ask ourselves as soon as this question the screen starts changing into a tv pause the tv the tv is showing a movie pause the movie and we pause it by asking a question what exactly is the problem right now say so, our mind may imagine this is the problem that is the problem that is the problem that is the problem yes there are many problems that are possible but right now what is the problem worry is often like the interest we pay on loans we haven't yet taken <laughs> so if you look at most of our worries they are about future eventualities they may happen they may not happen and if they happen we have to deal with them but the way we deal with them is in the present and this question what exactly is the problem right oh i might be fired okay what exactly is the problem right now oh but if i am fired where will i stay what exactly is the problem right now oh my boss looked in strange way at me okay what exactly is the problem right now oh i had some work and i did not i not met the deadline yes so as so when fear appears like a mist it just paralyzes us this 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 we can't see anything but what exactly is the problem when we ask this question if we have a flashlight and is giving this focus light and we first flash it in the sky we will not see anything but if you have flashlight and focus it in one direction then we can see the path ahead similarly for us this question focuses our attention what exactly is the problem right now next is e e is engage now on that inner screen a horror movie has started off and that horror movie go may start playing whatever it wants but it's our screen and we can choose what appears on the inner screen so we direct that inner screen by asking the second question what can i do about this right now what can i do about this right now 
sociologists and psychologists have studied when about when people worry the most now obviously it's not that people have a daily worry time it's every evening 7 to 7 30 is my worry time in my schedule i'll put it this is a time to worry it's not like that worry at one level is like a constant background noise that's going on within us however worry catches us the most when we are not doing anything constructive. During our idle time, our mind works over time. Just when we thought, now I have done my work, now let me relax. That's the time when we start worrying the most. So by these two activities, focus and engage, we get the mind we, to focus on two Concentrate on the present. As it says, live in the present. So we interact with the world through our observation and through our action. So focus directs our observation towards the present. What exactly is the problem right now? And engage directs our action towards the present. What can I do about it right now? And just by doing these two things, the hold of fear on us will decrease. Now the, the fear inducing problem may still be there and it needs to be dealt with. But often the fearsome situation is not the problem. The fear inducing situation is not the problem. The fear induced within us is the problem. There's a problematic situation, we can deal with it. Now, life determines our problems, but our mind determines the size of those problems. The more we dwell on it, the more this horror movie moves forward, 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 the more we become fearful. So focus and engage, get us down to the practicals. What can I do about it right now? I grew up in Mumbai, which is the financial capital of India. It is also an educational hub. So one of the prominent medical colleges in that city, we had a student. She used to come for some of our spiritual programs. And she was a, she was a topper. She, topper is an Indian word. It just means uh, she was number one. Always. She was in medical college, there eight semesters. So seven semesters, she had been first in the university. And in the eighth semester also, she had prepared very well, well on track to come first. But somehow before her exam, she got the fear. She, one thought appeared. What if I don't come first? What if I don't come first? Oh, I've got such a reputation. Everybody respects me as the number one. What if I don't come first? And that one thought grew within us so much. She started becoming jittery. She started becoming fearful. She became paranoid. And to the horror of everyone else, the night before the exam, she committed suicide. For no reason. She was well prepared in her exam, for her exams. And even if she had not come first, what's the big deal? She would have come second or third. Her career was bright ahead. But just that thought, what if I don't come first? Now for us, when we think of it, it seems absurd. Why would anyone commit suicide over this? But for her, what was happening? That one thought, if I don't come first, that started a horror movie inside her. And as that horror movie went further and further and further, it made her feel that her life itself was unbearable. So focus and engage, get us back to the present so that we can deal with the situation as it is. Then we have third, is arise. Arise means that we have, I talked about this body, mind and soul, three level reality. Now we exist at the third level. In the example of the outer, sc outer screen, inner, outer scene, inner screen and inner seer, it's horizontal like this. We could make that vertical, body, mind and soul. 
So there are situations and there are emotions. But we exist above our situations and above our emotions. As spiritual beings, as the observer, we are not affected by any of these. Now, what do we mean we are not affected? Normally we think of our emotions, happiness, distress, anger, fear, as results of the situation. So we usually think of our emotion, our experience of life, our experience of emotions, say happiness. We think of it as a happiness or distress, as a one step process. This is the cause, this is the result. This thing happened, that's why I'm afraid. This thing happened, that's why I'm unhappy. However, our experience is never a one step process. From this to this, there are other two steps in between. That same situation doesn't automatically create a particular experience for us. Let's take a simple example. Suppose there's a there's some program, maybe somebody's birthday, and they are throwing after the party, and then there is a cake and there is a feast after that. So suppose there's a desert over there. Would anyone like to share what is their favorite desert? Ice cream. Ice cream. Just ice cream? Any specific ice cream? Uh, vanilla bean. Vanilla bean. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so suppose you know that there is a little bean ice cream over there. Now naturally, if you like that ice cream, you'll be anticipating. When will I get, when will this when will the ice cream come? And then the whole event gets over and then the food is being served. And you notice there's no ice cream over there. What happened? And then you ask the organizers, you don't want to seem too greedy, but at the same time you discreetly ask. And the organizers say, oh, we are sorry. Actually, the vendor was supposed to give it. He didn't uh, deliver it on time, so we're not able to have it. Now, when that same ice cream, is, that ice cream is not there, it'll create annoyance, maybe irritation within us. But suppose, say, somebody who also likes vanilla ice cream, that person two days before, that party is diagnosed with diabetes and is told you cannot eat ice creams. Now that person knows there's going to be ice cream over there. And I was thinking it's going to be pure agony. Everybody will be eating ice cream and I won't get any ice cream. And when that person comes to know, there's no ice cream. <sighs> so <laughs> the lack of the ice cream will actually bring relief. So what happened over here? The situation is the same, there's no ice cream. But for one person it caused irritation, for another it provided relief. So the point I'm making here is that the situation doesn't immediately determine our experience. The situation is interpreted by us, by our mind, according to context. And that determines our experience. So similarly, fear is not a one-step experience. This causes this. Yes, that particular situation is there. But for most of us, say if a fire breaks out, there'll be fear. If there's a firefighter, for them a fire breaks out, they will feel thrilled. Now I can do some action. Otherwise, I just sit on this table and do nothing. So the when we arrive, by such analysis, we're not just talking about the relativity of the experience. That's one aspect of it. But what I'm talking about is that this, we exist above our situations. And the situations affect us only to the extent we let them affect us. And further about this, we exist not only above our situations, we exist also above our emotions. What do I mean above our emotions? If you remember, I talked about this, the outer screen, which is outer scene, which is the physical reality, the inner screen, that is the mental reality. And then we are the inner seer. On, so when we talk about emotions, they appear on the inner screen. 
and then we exist above them as their observer. This can be understood if this is a little abstract. Before we go to emotions, normally everything that we experience, it begins with a thought. We think of something and then we feel something about it. That's how emotion comes up. Now the word thought, we use in two different senses. One is, I got a thought. And the other is, I have given this a lot of thought. When I say I got a thought, it's like on the inner screen some stimulus has popped up. I have given this a lot of thought means I have paid my attention to this and I have analyzed it. I have understood it. The same applies to our emotions also. And emotion can be something that appears within us. So somebody does something which makes us angry. Somebody something happens that makes us feel that creates fear within us. So if we understand that fear is something that is appearing on my inner screen. Now I can choose whether I focus on it or I don't focus on it. I exist beyond my emotions. That doesn't mean that we neglect or suppress our emotions. It means simply that we process our emotions appropriately. So arise means that we realize that our essence, we are the observer, the seer who exists beyond our situations and beyond our emotions. When we understand this point about arise, the result of this is that we see failure as a practical problem, not an existential problem. What is the difference between a practical problem and an existential problem? Many times if we fail, we think as if my life is over. If somebody fails at a particular interview, fails at a particular project, when we invest ourselves too much, so for this girl, she had invested herself so much in her academic career, and not just in her academic career, in her identity that I am the number one student. That just the possibility that I might, I might not be number one, that shook her so much that she preferred ending her life rather than facing that poss possibility. So essentially, if we recognize that I exist above the situation, then yes, if something goes wrong, it's a failure, I have to deal with it. But it doesn't threaten me personally. Failure is a practical problem, not an existential problem. My self-existence remains secure beyond all this. And last part is R is release. Release means that there are certain things which are not in our control. And worrying about them does two things. First is it decreases our ability to deal with the things that are in our control. And second is that it simply increases our anxiety. Because anyway, we can't do anything about it. Now, normally, we think of release as, as a sign of defeat, a sign of how can I let go of things? I have to keep control. I have to manage things. Now, we do have to do our part in managing things. But actually, we are parts of a whole far bigger than ourselves. And say, suppose we board a plane. Now, when we are going to board a plane, we are concerned that I should reach on time, I should have my boarding pass, I should have my ID proof. But we are not worried whether the plane has enough fuel or not. We don't worry, what if the pilot is drunk? We know there's a whole system that will take care of those things. Similarly, if you look at our own bodies, we know that to take care of our body, we have to eat food properly. But how food converts into energy, we don't know about it. Researchers, now that our technology is advancing, we try to create artificial substitutes for body organs. Say, the arm is not working, we can have prosthetic arm. If the heart is not working properly, we can have pacemaker. So the attempt is also being made to create, if somebody's digestive system doesn't work, can we create an art artificial digestive machine? 
Now the attempts are going on, but <laughs> researchers have realized that what we'll require is not a digestive machine, but a digestive factory. It's such a complicated process. When we eat food, how that food converts into energy, we just don't know. The only time we think about our digestion is when it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, we just take it for granted. Our very existence is dependent on many factors which are beyond our control. Now, this letting go is not abandoning. We let go of the things that are not in our control so that we can focus on the things that are in our control. In trying to control the things that are not in our control, we only increase our fear. But in focusing on the things that are in our control, we can deal with the situation better. I'll conclude with two examples. About this point of letting go and being responsible, being committed. So if we consider life to be like a tennis match, and a tennis match, sometimes the player is serving, sometimes the player is returning. When the player is returning, at that time, the player has very little control. The player may have a very strong forehand. But if the ball comes on the backhand, the player cannot hit on the forehand. The player hits on the forehand, they only hit empty air. So when the player is returning, the area of control for the player is very less. The player starts worrying, oh, what if the serve comes on my backhand? My backhand is not so good. Now that fear will only make that player paralyzed. And if the ball comes on the backhand also, the player will not be able to return. Even if it comes on the forehand, the player will be worried. So when some things are not in our control, we just have to accept what comes and deal with it as it comes. But when things are in our control, when the player is serving, the player has to do the best they can, serve the best possible be as assertive, even aggressive as required. So the diff difference is between the player, when they're serving and returning, the intent is the same. The intent is to play in such a way that they win. But the way they play, at least at the start of the game, is different. So when we release, that is the time we acknowledge that right now, in this situation, I have to return. Whatever life sends my way, I have to return it. If I try to control what life sends my way, I can't do that. So for example, now this talk is almost coming to an end. So when I am giving the talk, in a sense, I am serving. I am in control. What topic I am going to speak, which direction I am going to take, which example I am going to give, all that is in my control. But after the talk gets over, then if, they, if we have question answers, now at that time, I will be returning. I can't control what question is going to come. If I start worrying, or if somebody asks a difficult question that I can't answer, I start worrying about that, then I won't be able to speak what I can speak also. So release helps us to again focus on the things that are in our control. And by doing this, we, uh, applying this F-E-A-R, we understand that we are a part of something bigger than ourselves. Instead of trying to stand apart, thinking that I can have security while the whole world around me changes. We understand that we are a part of the whole. And in the, while being a part of the whole, we play our part and the whole will take care of the whole. So we understand that we are a part, but we are also a part of the whole. When we face fear, the best reaction is not to immediately respond, which would be usually a reaction. But if we can pause, if we can introspect, if we can focus, engage, arise and release, then we'll find that we'll be able to respond much better to the fears. Whatever life may get us to, if we grow spiritually, then our spirituality will get us through. Whatever life may get us to, our spirituality will get us through. 
I'll summarize. I spoke on the topic of finding security and insecurity. I started by talking of how practically most of our life is a search for security. From bolts to backups, from assurances to insurances, from armors to armies, we're all looking for security. And in this search of security, we often succumb to the lure of the security theater. That means we make elaborate arrangements for security, which only increase the illusion of security, not the actual security in reality. So when we think that if I'm driving a car, I might be safer than if I'm flying in a plane. I think if I'm sitting home and watching TV, I might be safer than if I'm jogging on the streets. But there is insecurity at one level everywhere. And then we can raise this question, where does this insecurity, first of all, the insecurity comes from the change that is there constantly happening outside. So where does our urge for security come from then? So the child in a remote tribe who has never heard of a pizza, desiring a pizza, raises the question. Similarly, our urge for security, our longing for security doesn't come from our external. Because nothing external lasts forever. It comes from our internal. That is the indestructible essence within us. In that connection, I talked about this three-level model of the self, the body, mind, and the soul, which is like the hardware, software, and user. And we did the thought, the thought experiment of relaxing, of relax tensing and relaxing different parts of the body to understand how we are the observers of the body. And inside us, even when the eyes are closed, we can see a mental picture of the bodily part and then we observe that also. That means we are observer of the body and we are observer of the mind, which is which can highlight various things, including the body. So, it, so the outer screen, outer scene is the body, physical reality, the inner screen is the mind and the soul is the inner seer. And then I talked about acronym fear for dealing with fear. Does anyone remember what this F-E-A-R was? F was? Focus, thank you. So when the inner screen becomes like a TV showing a horror movie, that's when fear overcomes us. So like that, suddenly seeing a gorilla outside the window. So then we pause that movie by asking the question, what exactly is the problem right now? Then E was engage, thank you. That means, we direct the inner screen to show a particular thing rather than just going here and there. What can I do about this right now? Without these two questions, we are like fighting mist. But with these two questions, we get some practical action to do. During our idle time, our mind works over time. So worry is like the, the, like the tax that we pay on, loans that we are not yet taken. So bring our focus back to the present. However, what if the present itself is fearful? Not just future possibility, but if the present itself is fearful, then what do we do? Then I talked about A. Was A was what? Arise. arise, thank you. So arise means I understand that I am the observer of my situations and I am the observer of my emotions. With respect to situations, you give the example of say, you're going for a party and there's the desired desert is not there. One person might feel annoyance, the other person might feel relief. So our experience is not just a one-step event. This event causes this experience. Rather, it's two-step. And by understanding this, uh, different people can experience the same situation different. We understand that we are observers. We are processors of the situation. And similarly, with respect to our emotions also, we can say that a thought is an event that appears inside us. I got a thought. A thought refers to the attention that we give. That is, I give this a lot of thought. So when the emotion appears within us, either we can identify with the emotion, I've, I'm, I'm feeling fear and I become fearful. Or I can identify the emotion, hey, that's fear appearing on the inner screen. I observe it and I distance myself from it. And R was release. Release means that if you understand that that we are a part of something bigger than ourselves. And we let go of the things that are not in our control. 
then you can catch hold of the things that are in our control. And this arise and release, where we understand that we exist at the spiritual level and we let go of those things that are not in our control. This arise and release becomes more and more possible if we grow spiritually by meditation, by mantra chanting, by various processes for self-awareness, we raise our consciousness at the spiritual level. And then, <coughs> I conclude by saying that whatever life may get us to, our spirituality will get us through. Thank you very much. When do we see a particular emotion as an intuition which can give us guidance and something which we can neglect? I say that I mentioned that we observe and then we choose to respond. So we have a overall, once we identify ourselves as existing above at a higher level of reality, then we can process. So we are not talking here about neglecting or rejecting all fearful, fear-inducing mm -hmm. stimuli as just fantasy of the mind. There are some situations which, in which there is a real cause for fear. And that's why engage means we are dealing with it practically also. So generally we think of our emotions in two terms. Either I express it or I repress it. But there's a third option, neither expressing nor repressing, but processing. Processing means that I observe the emotion and then if we are distance from it, we can evaluate it. One very good way to process our emotions is to treat ourselves like a second person. This is this idea of treating ourselves like another person. This is implicit in spiritual texts where we do self-observation. So imagine if a friend, maybe your sister or some relative, some, someone comes to you with the same situation that you are facing right now. How would you guide that person? So certainly if they are fearful, we love them, we are concerned about them. So we'll be concerned about their emotions also. But we won't let ourselves be dragged away by that emotion. Just because they are fearful doesn't mean we are. We will immediately become fearful. We'll observe, we'll analyze, and then we will counsel them. So similarly, if we could see that our mind is is a being different from us, it's a it's a entity different from us, and we have to evaluate it, no doubt. But after evaluating it, we respond to it. So then, uh, sometimes, the what the the thoughts that come inside us, they could be very important intuitions. And we do have to respond to them positively, take them into account. But the point here is that we, we don't impulsively give in to whatever comes in, we process it. And over a period of time, we also learn when it is our impulses speaking, see, and when it is our intuition speaking. Yeah, so there are times when we know that, okay, in this situation I get tense. If we do observe ourselves in the past, the situations, say, if I'm studying in a particular field or I'm working in a particular field, that field I'm good at, then when some, some voice comes up within me, probably, you know, this is, this is a good idea. I'm an expert in this field, this idea is coming. But if there are certain areas where we tend to be vulnerable, where we tend to be insecure. And in that area, a particular thought is coming up. What if this goes wrong? What if that goes wrong? Now that is more likely to be a, just a fearful impulse than any wise intuition. 
so rather than worrying so much about whether something is a intuition or a impulse we first focus on distancing ourselves from it and then we process it if we process it then naturally we'll be able to decide okay this is intuition let me act on uh, act positively with this and if it's a it's a impulse then let me distance myself from it let's answer your question yeah. so it sounds like almost always we should not act immediately <laughs> uh should we not always act immediately not necessarily because there are times when we are good at some things so sometimes it's called gut feeling or uh, it's we, we use some different words i got a hunch so if somebody is good at something say for example some people are very good at say interior home design they just come into a room and somebody might have been living in that room for 10 years but they don't think of this okay just you move the sofa here you put this frame here you put a curtain over here it look much better how you do that immediately hey it's great that's how it is so where we are good at we already have those instincts and even acting immediately on it sometimes that's the time when the, the idea has come we have to catch it now with respect to warnings okay don't do this so for example when we are working in some creative field and we feel this is not going to work i should i should not do this now at that point it's a little gray zone is it uh, our fear speaking or is it you could say our experience or our intuition speaking at that time the best thing to do is if oh, it's on an overall area where we are reasonably good at and we go along with our feeling we just do what it takes and then if it turns out to be wrong sometimes in our life we make right decisions and sometimes we make the decisions right okay, i took this decision this is not work out really the way that i wanted i make it right now that's also possible it's not that uh, we always always have to get the right suggestion only this takes one step at a time and you will find out if it's right it's fine if it's not right we do course correction is that answer your question thank you thing else you yeah, like say something thank you you have any other question no that's i mean this uh, it sounds like a very good way to live life but i guess uh, most of us are limited and we are not objective people <laughs> so how in real life how do you implement this okay yeah like most of uh, you get like a better sense of analysis and stuff but uh, no matter how much you try to put it like focus it's just yeah definitely yeah. see we are not completely objective people so how do we apply this i would say that it's not application of all this is not like digital logic it's either you do it or you don't do it to some extent a negative reaction when bad things happen is natural and that's just being human but there are magnitudes of the reaction suppose if there's a firefighter now normally if if a new person joins as a firefighter when they see a fire big fire break out they just become so fearful that the hose drops from their hand and they become panicky on the other hand if somebody is a seasoned firefighter if on seeing a giant fire even they will be fearful but all the training and the experience means that the healthier response will come faster the fear will be there initially but for a trained firefighter the okay the fear will be overcome okay let's attack this fire from here let's pour water over here you go over there you do this so it's not that even the best firefighter will never feel fear but just that by experience uh, a novice firefighter may take a long time to to compose oneself and act whereas a experienced firefighter will be able to compose oneself faster so similarly we now in that case even a few moments speed in composing oneself can mean saving a, somebody's life or saving some property so similarly for us we don't have to expect that 
we can be completely unemotional and objective but whatever level of objectivity we can bring in that can help us suppose we become angry with someone now they have done something which upset us anger is natural but as soon as we realize i become angry I can catch myself now if we don't catch ourselves at that time also then it will be much worse say if the floor is slippery and we walk and we slip at one level because the floor is slippery slipping is natural but as soon as we notice we are slipping we are falling we look can i catch hold of something as soon as i catch hold of it then the the fall will be less intense and we can gain our footing back faster the slipping is natural in a sense so like that feeling fear when we go through negativities when we go through adversity that's natural but this thought structure fear acronym that can act like a pillar for us so when we are about to slip instead of slipping fully we can catch hold of it and come back and have a healthier come back to composure faster and have a healthier reaction more easily and that can save us a significant amount of trouble was that answer your question thank you thank you yes please thank you yeah please Okay. Uh, well, I wouldn't say that your ask question is when was it that you became aware of that emotion as being separate from you? Uh, yeah, so I would say that Yeah. The experience, yeah. I would say it's rather than calling it as uh one event when we attain a state like that. after which we stay there like that our consciousness goes up and down and there are moments in the experience like that so i remember last year when i came to america i was the immigration i was just entering into america and suddenly as i was passing through the security there was a loud alarm and before i could understand i, I usually use a wheelchair for traveling before i could understand what was happening there were like five six American security force the guns pointed at me what happened so the person told me that we found that in your crutches there's a high explosive alert so then i said okay uh, i said no no the in person came over there and he said that we are going to have to break your crutches I said, "You have to see what is the answer." I said, "If you break my crutches, how will I walk?" So probably he was in a foul mood or whatever. I said, "That's not my problem." So now, actually, I had to catch a connecting flight to go to another place. So I was a little initially I was annoyed, but now I started getting alarmed. And as I was about to respond, I could see this person was angry, and he was not going to listen to me. And it's almost as if at that time I observed myself from above. and there is a there's a verse in the bhagavad gita i like to recite the bhagavad gita's verses in my mind so there's a verse in the bhagavad gita which says that our wanderings in life are guided by the divine who is always with us so just that verse came in my mind i said thinking i have traveled across so many countries gone through so many flights if things had to go wrong hundreds of times things could have gone wrong if through all those situations i have been guided through and even th through the situation i'll be guided so just a thought calm me down and then and the security person came along and he said that he was saying that we'll have to break your crutches so at that time he was a he picked up the crutches another person came on because it was a big noise he said he looked at this person looked at me said, what's going on here he said that we had a high security alert so he looked at me once again he said i'll deal with this you can go well he was his boss and then he picked up the crutches he said we he explained to me that this is what has happened i said have you got anything inside which no sir i don't have got anything i haven't got anything i said then he told me that 
And then I told him that if you want to search anything, you can open the clutches. You don't have to break them. Oh, really? You can open them? They started opening it. And they opened it from the bottom. They put some kind of prong inside that. And some dark material came out of it. He says, what is this? He asked me. He says, that's mud. He says, what is mud doing over here? He put his hand inside, he took it out again. He put his, that, that object inside, took it out, again some more mud came out. So what had happened was, before I had come to America, I had gone in India to a pilgrimage place. That's a, there's a sacred river called Yamuna in Vrindavan. And somehow that river has got very polluted. So the polluted metallic content has accumulated in sediment, has sedimented on its bank. So when I had gone there with my crutches, the rubber padding below the crutches had come off and the mud from there had gone inside. And that polluted mud had sounded that metal alarm, metallic alarm. So where he saw that, he, he just pulled out, there's more mud. And then finally he said, no, cleaning your, crutch, cleaning your crutches was not my business. You take the crutches. <laughs> <laughs> so at that time it struck me that at one moment, I was fearful. What is going to happen now? If they break my crutches, they, if they suspect me, arrest me, whatever. But next moment, when I observed myself from above, and thought, you know, there's a, there's a force guiding my matrix. Like one moment, there was fear. The next moment, there was calmness. So these kind of experiences give me the conviction that the spiritual is for real. I won't say that I'm there already, but I'm on the path towards there. And when during some critical moments in our life, we get some experiences which help us to deal with life's issues, then that helps us, as I said, whatever life may get us to, our spirituality will get us through. So that's one experience which I have had. Thank you. Oh yes, no. when I come in fall, I'll be coming to Seoul. When I come next next March, April, I'm planning to come to Salt Lake City. Thank you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.